I, I want to thank all of you for um, inviting me to this uh, incredible context that you have generated. Uh, so, yes, if we can get this light uh, off, that would be fantastic. Since Liam is not going to join us, I promised him I would uh, impersonate him and Kim Kardashian at the same time. So, if you see any eccentricities, just blame it on that. Um, as much as I was going to uh, go deeply into Office Arts as a project, I realized over the conversations in the last 24 hours that many of you are not necessarily familiar with what the storefront is or what the storefront for art and architecture does. So, um, is, is this really loud? The volume, maybe? No, it's okay? Right. So, um, I'm going to trailblaze uh, over probably 40 minutes about what is a storefront for art and architecture and what is this institution that uh, since 2010 I've been directing and, and what does a place like that offer to any of us that is interested in the proposition of alternative ideas within the world of art and architecture. Um, so many people actually know the storefront for its iconic facade, yet uh, what we are going to perhaps discover is the depth, the historical depth that uh, storefront occupies. And, and as, a, as an architect that I am, and yet at the same time as a director, uh, I do need to constantly understand what are the desires behind everything that, that we produce, that we construct, and what are not only the collective aspirations, but also the individual aspirations behind each project. Um, this is a book that, uh, I mean, obviously it is a book, um, that I received when I was a student in Princeton as a gift from my parents uh, and my sister, um, containing not necessarily pages, but something else. Obviously, that book was emptied in order to smuggle something that was not allowed, and maybe now it is allowed. And so the question is that, that now that these things are legal, this book remains empty in my desk together to five other editions of these empty books. And so my question to you and to myself constantly is what I would want these books to contain. What is that that one ultimately desires? So um, maybe at the end of the lecture, some of you might remember this and ask what was inside of that. But ultimately the question is what is that that we ultimately desire as individuals or as collectives? So with that space, um, Storefront was founded because a group of individuals in 1982 had the desire to really bring individuals with different disciplinary labels uh, together into a space of convergence. And um, this is the inaugural event. A bunch of people in the street, in the sidewalk, trying to question and rethink what culture means and what can actually culture produce in the reimagination of the city and the built environment. Storefront started uh, by Keon Park. It uh, was a space that at the beginning was uh, in Prince Street in New York City, in Soho, and it moved in 1985 uh, actually into this triangular space in Kenmore and Lafayette, where many people nowadays know it. As you see, is an extremely small triangular space, almost just a sliver that inserts itself within the fabric of the city. And while it is extremely small within this Manhattan footprint, Storefront is somehow in the, in the center of many architectural conversations. I always say that the first building that I went to see in New York after I visited the Empire State Building was a storefront. And unfortunately, I found it closed. That was way back in 1999. But yet the truth is, is that Storefront has been a space in the collective imaginary of many people as a space not only for an iconic facade, but for experimentation. Before that uh, uh, facade by Stephen Hall and Vito Conchi was designed, uh, the facade was always a space for the reimagination and the reconstruction of possible alternatives. This exhibition was an exhibition with different toilets where uh, the facade was open as a way to uh, uh, exercise one of those uh, visceral needs and the gallery space, the inside, was accumulating those residues that sometimes are not visible making again this idea of the privacy and, and publicity and the inside and the outside uh, a blurred network or boundary. So in 1994, 93 actually, Claudia Gould uh, commissioned Vito Conchi and Stephen Hall, Vito Conchi is still an artist at the time, to do a collaborative project um, and to try to reinvent for a temporary uh, process, uh, for a temporary moment, um, the facade of a storefront. 
Um, this facade was supposed to last for six months, was built as a temporary project, and as a temporary project, um, storefront didn't even ask for a permit, and what is interesting about this is that we still don't have a permit, and so it has been already 25 years that the facade has been there, and yet we still don't have a permit. And so what is fascinating about that is the idea that we don't necessarily like to ask for permission, but for mercy. And as an attitude, that's something that probably we will keep on seeing. So over the years, the facade and the gallery have been the scenario for many interventions. This one actually just last summer, the other one was just last year, White Soil, in which these questions of what constitutes the gallery space, the space of culture, and the space of disciplinary or, let's say, a exposure of ideas from a particular voice to the space of the public sphere or the audience or the sidewalk or the passerby is constantly questioned and problematized by this facade that turns the walls and in this case actually is being wrapped around and uh, uh, encased in this frozen moment of questioning this inside and this outside. So with this, with this attitude of always thinking uh, of, of this boundary, of this corner, uh, uh, of what constitutes the limit and what I like always to think is that while this is a corner uh, uh, there are moments in which other corners are produced and, and so with, with that image of the facade I always like to think that the store from more than a facade is also a plan and a plan where actually Stoffen, it is not only this image, it actually is what happens in it. And I like to think it more in a kind of a plan format, where even the hall towards the basement, where we have the TV studio, and I will be talking about that a, a bit later on, is actually the representation of this space that doesn't make a distinction between the flows of what occurs inside and outside. So, from this image, again going back into the inaugural day of Stoffen in 1982, in which you cannot actually even think if this is um, a, an exhibition, a performance, a fight, a protest, and yet probably is at the same time. And it is this dissolution of what uh, is the role of art, what is the role of performance, that I think it is important to understand what a storefront's function is. Some of these drawings are uh, uh, architects that have been asked to draw a storefront, and sometimes they say a storefront is simply a mirror that reflects what society is actually outside of itself. So, Storefront operates in five different areas of action. Uh, there are exhibitions, there are events, there are publications, competitions, and projects. And through these five lines of inquiry, I'm going to tell you some of the curatorial methodologies that we have been using in order to try to produce and, and transmit some of those ideas. Um, the issues and the subjects at hand that have been part of Storefront's history have always tried to dwell uh, uh, on the experimental nature, but also on the critical aspects uh, of, of societal uh, uh, problems. And so, um, one of the important projects that uh, Keon Park, that is actually here, uh, together with Shirin Neshat, that was at the time the co-director with Keon, they both of them started the storefront, and they ran it for more than 10 years, was the questions of homelessness, and how homelessness in the year really affected public space. And so, from doing guerrilla tactics of uh, uh, different uh, uh, stances through the city to actually providing kitchen, uh, uh, soup kitchens, um, Storefront has always tried to ask questions that were delicate, and sometimes they have disappeared from the, the political uh, contested spaces of, of the political context, meaning the US. So, queer space in, in 94, created by Beatriz Colmina, Mark Bigley, and company. Uh, was something that, that from 94 to 2015 somehow moved away from, from the space of like contested when like, gay marriage became legal, yet still queer space is something that uh, keeps being uh, 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 of central importance. Yet also exhibitions sometimes have taken the space of experimentation not so much into an arena of political action, uh, but more of an aesthetic perception that has political consequences from Yves Klein Air Architecture to some other exhibitions like this one that was for Occupy Wall Street uh, and, and that was happening at the same time that the Occupy movement was uh, occurring not so far away from my house. We made uh, a call for action for a strategy for public occupation and so the idea is that uh, even when the projects are going from an aesthetic nature to a political nature, we like to think of the power of both simultaneously and at the same time. So. Projects like this one from Daniel Arshan, in which the gallery is taken over by a mass, and the exhibition 
is not uh, something that is pre-established as a set of duration, but something that takes its own temporality. Sometimes when people come with an idea of an exhibition and, and they say, uh, well, what is the standard duration of an exhibition and stuff? And I said, how long should the exhibition be? How long should your project last? Is it a minute, an hour, a second, a year? I wish someone comes to me with a project that should last a year so I don't have to think about it. So um, in this case, this was a month of excavation. Um, the exhibitions try to take not only the space of display, and we all here know what means a space of display versus a space of performance or representation. How does either a wall carry an image or how does a wall perform the image that it's carrying is something that I think architecturally has been part of the, of the conversation about what it means to produce uh, uh, exhibitions that go beyond the, the idea of display versus the idea of performance. So in this case that was painting urbanism by Hazan Han who had been doing several works in, in the favelas in Rio de Janeiro and in other sites uh, in a certain way acting on the surface of the city as a new form of urbanism. That's why we call the exhibition painting urbanism. So if, if we are not able to be houseman anymore and we are not able to cut the avenues of Paris in order to make large interventions in the city, maybe what we can actually do is to intervene in this libidinal surface and produce what we call the painting urbanism. And as much as we try to find the permits this time and, and uh, act on the surface of the city itself, we have to keep ourselves and contain within the gallery, but still try to use the gallery as a space for, for the experimentation and the testing of the ideas themselves. This was an exhibition that, that actually used dance and performance as a way to problematize this idea of viewing uh, uh, and spectator and spectatorship and performance and, and, and being performed, where uh, the dancers constantly were able to problematize. Maybe. Yes, we're able to problematize the relationship of the spectator inside and outside, opening the panels and transforming this audience into actually part of this stage. So, running into the next slide that you have already seen, and this is an exhibition that we had last, last year by Sebastian Razuriz, that uh, what it actually did was to try to bring 12 very important questions that uh, uh, are part of the American society, of the US society, and try to face them on, literally, and produce objects like this jacket, the, uh, the college jacket of the rapist, in which suddenly one could really think about uh, what are some of the uh, strategies that by selling this jacket by $100,000, one could pay the fees that uh, a victim of rape needs in order to defend itself against the players of a college that actually most of the times is being defended by the university legal system because they don't want the scandals because actually football and, and sports is one of the big income sources for university uh, 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 finances. So uh, from that to questions of labor and the United States of Mexico helmet, understanding that in fact there is an entire labor force that is not being acknowledged, that is a new state uh, uh, of, of citizenship. So um, from exhibitions that take really like the political in a very, very serious way uh, to exhibitions that try to question questions of economy. The next one, Storefront for Sale, was uh, uh, launched on the framework when the Met, the Metropolitan Museum, uh, just um, accepted a huge donation by the Koch family to uh, rebuild their plaza. And of course, if you actually go around any museum, you will start realizing that the chairs have a name, meaning the chairs are, are named after someone. The room is the room of the Rockefellers, or the room is the room of someone else. And the question is, what, it, what, it, what is it in a name? And who is paying for those things? And what kind of redemption people expect to have by putting their name into a cultural space? So, of course, we, we did was to go through all the museums from MoMA to New Museum to uh, the Guggenheim and really find the names and the sponsors behind toilets, auditoriums, and every single space. And we said, well, you know, let's have no shame. Let's put the stuff on for sale. Let's sell everything that we do have. So um, each one of those pictures were made in this kind of like lottery scratch system so that people could go and look behind uh, the images, but one had to be curious. And one had to be curious enough to know how that money had been produced, meaning where was it coming from? Was it coming from oil? Was it coming from ecological exploitation, from uh, different kind of like 
uh, uh, societal exploitations, and we ask uh, six artists and architects to do a series of interventions. One of them said, shut up storefront, so they actually put a price on everything. You could close the gallery for a month, uh, you could actually put me on holidays or just buy me for a month too, and, or you could buy a seat or you could buy many, and, and unfortunately no one really bought me, it would have been a great, great, great present to me. But, um, but what was also really funny, this is actually Ethan Eden, um, he actually did a, a work of uh, uh, Corpopoli, in which all the big corporations and all the big philanthropic numbers were being placed and we were going to invite any director of uh, development for each institution in New York City to try to share uh, the big philanthropic resources that they have. So how do we take seriously the economic mechanisms behind the production of art and, and how do we try to understand them? This is a project that uh, yesterday I mentioned uh, when, uh, when I was with uh, some of you. Um, Letters to the Mayor is an initiative that, uh, so we have been talking about questions of like politics and societal struggle within the US, questions of financial and, and economic struggle. And so the question goes then in, in terms of political and political empowerment and how do we understand the relationship between the creative force and, and, and political, political action. So this was a project that, uh, we, as you can see here, we see microphones and ties and shovels and helmets and scissors and ribbons. And these are the devices that, that mayors really love when they actually inaugurate an ex in a, a construction site or a new building. So we ask 50 architects around the world to write a letter to their mayors. And, and what was incredible about these letters is that, um, of course it wasn't the occasion that the elections in New York were coming, but what was fascinating about these 50 different letters is that many of them really put their mayors in, in attention and most of them are actually obliged to respond. So they had to respond back to the architects and also to ourselves. And, and yet what was interesting about this is that the exhibition has been traveling and, and, and meaning not necessarily literally traveling but it has uh, made a new iteration in Panama City. It's going to have one in, in Buenos Aires and another one in Medellin. And, and hopefully we are thinking about maybe one should actually happen here in, in Kiev for uh, uh, the fall elections that you're having. So this wallpaper that was the one covering the entire gallery walls was the one that really tried to understand how architecture is the wallpaper for politics and yet what we want to do is to reverse that kind of wallpaper. But one of the side notes, and I think that it sometimes is important to explain everything that happens behind a, a curatorial uh, act. These 50 architects that I ask around the world um, they were 48 women and two men because they really wanted to be inclusive, you know? And so the idea of how do we do gender politics and how do we try to really bring equality, sometimes it's really hard. I mean, I could only find two men, but at least I had two, right? So um, it, was, it, was really, it was really an effort. So, and I, and I think the project is powerful enough to have to, to function just in one layer, but how does one add subtext? And, and as I say, this is only something that I actually explain it when I explain it in a lecture, but not necessarily, of course, in the curatorial text or in part of the exhibition. So, this kind of subversive techniques, if you want, or this kind of uh, curatorial strategies is something that I'm very interested in, sometimes even to the point of failure. And so, uh, this exhibition, Past Features, Present Features, was an exhibition that uh, uh, collected 100 visionary projects that were never built in New York City over the last 100 years. And uh, we gave these 100 projects to 100 contemporary architects and artists, and we asked them to reimagine them, to re-envision, to make them present or future. And, and to try to see what was that, that those projects that, that had not happened could still sit and, and, and in a certain way fecundate some future ideas. Um, so you start imagining what are all these visionary projects in your head, right? So of course if you receive this email and you say, oh, past futures, present futures, 100 visionary projects, wow. So you would arrive to the exhibition and, and you would see the title again, past, present, futures. And then you would see these, these blinds here and, and this kind of mirror effect and, and then you would enter the exhibition and, and you would see yourself more or less broken in the reflection of these mirror blinds. And, and you would walk around and, and you would find really, truly nothing. And so, um, and so 
then you would realize that you see this little black sliver here. This was uh, what we call these contextual forms, in which these um, uh, little stickers um, vertically uh, were attached, um, actually giving you some information about a project. So these contextual forms were saying past, features, present, features, random contextual information. So it was 1968, New York, the number of inhabitants, who was the mayor, a random relevant fact, the world, the population, neologisms, meaning what words were invented that year, what words became obsolete, what kind of music had been composed, what were films, what books, what elements really constituted a, a, a kind of advancement within that particular context. And after getting all of this, we would have a QR code. I don't know if you love QR codes, but I don't think anyone loves QR codes, right? So it was a higher level of frustration in which you were like, what are they telling me suddenly? And so we said, we invite you to imagine what architecture should be produced within this context. Like, really? You're inviting me to imagine what architecture should be in this? And it's like, if you want to know what past future projects were produced in this context, please scan this QR code with your mobile device. Meaning, we're not going to show you the architectures at all. And so, why is that? And, and why is it so important to try to stop that kind of consumption of images, of instant gratification, of the visionary futurist floating zeppelin over our heads, is something that I'm very interested in. How do I allow for a space of reflection? I think it is an important uh, responsibility of the, of the curatorial act. So the, ultimately, of course, some of these uh, forms found their future elements, and in the future ones we allowed for the images to occur. So within this space of, of, of confusion and kind of what they called a heterochrony in a kind of homage to uh, Foucault and his heterotopias, a place where time not, is not necessarily following a kind of linear conclusion, but is in a certain way lapsing and confusing itself, Leon Leon were actually asked to produce a space that was able to disrupt time and space. And so within, within this uh, space of confusion, we added another layer that uh, it was seven speakers uh, that were working in what we called a kind of acoustic gyroscope. So when you would be walking from this direction, uh, there would be a trigger. And so if you kept on moving, you would hear 1968, Buckminster Fuller, Dome over Manhattan. But if you were staying here, you would just hear 1968, 1969, 1970s. And the idea here is that you can only be part of time if you're constantly moving. And this idea that we need to be constantly in flow. So the exhibition was, in fact, uh, uh, working with many different individuals. This was David Drive trying to program and, and uh, working together with Vito Acconci to really record uh, all these different voices uh, and, and with uh, Leon Leon. And, of course, producing a room where you ultimately could see the images, but not fully, just simply broken, in a space in which mirrors would act also as a reflection of the gaze that it was being projected into the search of those visionary images. So, don't ask me if I'm complicated, I'm not. Um, uh, so, ultimately, of course, uh, people produce incredible images and, and, and visionary projects uh, of like, for instance, taking over uh, with nature uh, the East River or really trying to understand what is this kind of vertical urbanism. Uh, this is Jonathan Solomon uh, taking somehow some of his learnings from Hong Kong. And, and of course this is going to be in a book form and where all those different layers of information will come together. And so to understand that each one of these different formats requires a needs of a temporality and a space and to be able to use uh, at extremis what is that that an exhibition can offer that a book cannot and vice versa is something that for me is extremely important. So we went through exhibitions and, and now I'm jumping into, into events and for the ones that have been to storefront know that more or less uh, uh, is as important what happens in the sidewalk as what happens inside the gallery. And in fact sometimes the conversations outside are much more interesting than the ones that happen inside. Um, from events that try to insert the layers of uh, activity into the facades across the street to manifestos that are hanging above our heads. Over the last five years we have created a series of formats uh, that try to defy the idea of the lecture. I mean, I can give the same lecture 500 more times probably, but I would love to be provoked to have a different format that allows me, not that allows me, that forces me to reinvent without what I'm actually saying. So, I'm, I'm, since I am a victim of my own uh, processes, every time that someone wants to come to storefront to do either a book lunch or to talk about something, I'm asking them to, to engage in one of those formats. And so we have the manifesto series, we have the productive disagreements, 
And this is one of the interesting ones that people sometimes say, you know, we just want to have a party. We just really want to have like an event and celebrate that we are done or finished or doing a book. And I said, okay, great, let's do that. I don't know, I'm sure that you have been to enough weddings where uh, someone is, is raising a glass and making a toast. And it is in that moment of toasting where actually they are saying some truths that will never be repeated and shamelessly so. And so, um, and I said, well, maybe that's the right way to celebrate things. Mostly because when we had an event that was, uh, it was called productive disagreements, meaning knowing that there are people who disagree and we asked them to disagree. Mostly because in the States, people, they don't necessarily know how to disagree. People didn't disagree at all. So I said, maybe if we ask them to really be enthusiastic, then they will start to be critical. And indeed so. So, uh, and that's why uh, trying to understand the curatorial exercise as, as something that tries to read and to be careful in, in, in understanding the, the, the societal constructs and the, the, let's say, the societal forms and try to transform them. This is uh, a format that came out of my understanding of how many of us wants to do a book and how many of us is going to do many books and how many of us actually has never thought who is going to be reading that book. Um, and so I always like to think that the book is a crime, and it should be a crime against a particular uh, uh, space or history that precedes it. So for the book launches, we develop an interrogation series in which literally almost as a kind of police, police investigation, uh, we have these spaces of interrogation, and yet sometimes we like to take it very lightly. And this is a cabaret series uh, in, in which ideas are being exposed in a kind of flamboyant way in which a, a, a fog machine is producing a cloud in which a PhD dissertation fragment is read for the first time, making more sense than ever before. So, of course, sometimes we also have serious uh, events or like very informal events, and yet um, someone was asking me, what is the lecture tomorrow? I said, well, we're going to be talking about very serious things, and so many not so serious. So, uh, I like to think that as a curator, as a a director or as a mediator, I, I, I do carry particular cultural uh, uh, contexts and, um, and yet those ones, they are tools uh, as much as they are languages to be able to produce particular uh, uh, spaces. This looks like a paella and it is a paella. And yes, it is an event in which um, there are questions that I cannot ask directly with a microphone because you're going to feel offended, right? Maybe. But if I'm cooking a paella, if, I could try, I don't know you enough, right? But, um, but if I'm cooking a paella for you, and you are waiting because we are going to all eat it, and I will ask the question and you will react very differently, even if the question is the same. And that is the virtue of, um, of actually attaching ourselves to rituals in which maybe one might just remember in the like, Sunday morning when your parents are cooking and as you were, were you yesterday night, right? And so it's very similar to that act in which particular delicate conversations, we make them around uh, those spaces of food consumption. And so it's, it's really important for me to try to understand what formats are able to produce what spaces of reflection. And so moving from the exhibitions to the events now to the publications, um, you would say, Eva, hey, this is not a publication, it's a pamphlet. And I would say, no, this is the oldest publication that the storefront has had. And actually, it is being compiled uh, uh, in this book that uh, Joseph Grima, uh, one of the uh, previous directors, did. We think of the website also as a, as a publication space. And if you have not subscribed to our newsletter, I encourage you to go and visit and do so. Um, but, but this newsletter is something that still is being sent through the traditional means of communication, uh, meaning by post. And um, it is also for us a space in which artists are being asked to rethink and, and, and question what it means to produce an image that might uh, stick on the walls. Um, as, a, as an institution that is very interested in all these different spaces of communication and action, books take a very similar space of experimentation. Uh, three years ago with Lars Muller we started a collaborative program for publications of these manifestos that occur at the gallery and, and we have started this manifesto series. The first one was formless and the second one was double, in which those events that happen at the gallery, sometimes in a whimsical way, sometimes in a very serious way, find uh, another temporality in the, space, in the space of the book. 
in which uh, we are all able to actually rethink and reflect on those issues. And yet, so from all these different spaces, one probably of the ones that I enjoy the most is the competitions. And Stoffan has been doing competitions over, throughout its, its history, always asking that, that no one really dared to ask in some ways. And so we all have seen many reinventions of dollar signs and currencies, but this was all the way back in, in the 80s. And, and of course it was in this case really rethinking about questions of energy and what is that that actually, what kind of currency we should be thinking about. Or when the Whitney uh, was uh, launching a competition about its uh, uh, enlargement before it actually moved to its new location, Storfron did an, yet another competition about questions of uh, American architecture or social identity and so on. Um, and and uh, all the way back when Obama was up for election in its first uh, uh, time, uh, a competition about the redesign of the White House as the house of supposedly the most powerful person in the world. Uh, what is the architecture? What is that 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 building should represent? And what kind of forms should be uh, representing that space of decision making? So White House Redux for me was one of the very interesting competitions. At that time I was teaching in Buffalo and I remember I inscribed myself to participate in it, um, what I never did, um, but I wish I did. So some of the competitions are born out of this. Um, this, was, um, this was a picture I took going on my bike from store from home when I passed by um, the Occupy Wall Street movement in Liberty Square and I found um, the arts and culture section um, and I got totally depressed, right? Uh, not only by the quality of the sign, but, uh, but probably because of the quality of the sign. I, I said, okay, we can do more than that and we need to get together to understand how arts and culture can contribute into the understanding of, of the articulation of uh, power structures and citizenship. So we did an open call for a strategies for public occupation in which that uh, relationship was problematized, and, and you saw some of those images before. So competitions, they of course take still sometimes the, 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 the physical form, uh, uh, taking uh, spaces within New York City. This was a competition that we organized together with the new museum for the Idea City Festival, where every two years, with the same budget that it cost to actually build temporary tents, we try to actually give the opportunity to emerging architects to produce a new kind of uh, urban uh, canopy that is able to bring us uh, beyond or further of that what a white tent would give us. In this case, uh, a return to not the cell phone mode, but the sky mode that the city can produce by producing a kind of reflective surface and at the same time a space for like the collapsing of the different gazes of the eyes of the visitors. So the idea that, that those ideas sometimes are conceptual but sometimes are physical is something that for us is also very important. So. Moving into one of the competitions that uh, for me, and this one was launched just uh, three years ago, is what is the competition that each one of you would like to enter? Meaning, I can keep on asking questions, but what is the question that you would like to be asked? So, um, the competition of competitions was asking that, what was asking architects, artists, philosophers to write the briefs of the competitions that we would want the president of Ukraine to run? What is the competition that, that he should be actually putting out? What is the competition that the mayor of Kiev should do? And we cannot wait in the sidewalk waiting for him to come up with a brilliant idea of the right question. It is a role and responsibility as people interested in the participation and the construction of culture to actually write those briefs. So the competition of competitions was part of that. And the winning of this competition is going to be launched uh, this fall with the competition of the competition of competitions. Uh, and, and so that was, uh, the winning was taking buildings down. And, and something that yesterday was discussed again with, the, with one of the uh, TV interviews about what are the buildings that we should be taking down. And, and looking into some of the works that you guys have been developing in Mariupol, what is that that is occurring in, in either shrinking cities or in cities that have already been taken down and, and how do we understand that process also as a generative force. And so um, from uh, processes of 
uh, ideological uh, erasure to processes of acupunctural sanitation. What is that that we can do is something that we are interested in this competition and I do hope guys you keep track of us and participate. So of course projects sometimes take the form of different interventions in public space and commissions that we do with uh, uh, partnerships with the Russian Bird Foundation like this project by Jimenez Leib and Grayson Cox that has the same footprint as a storefront but is actually a mobile device where conversations and panel discussions can occur and sometimes taking this kind of instant city and so depending where we go and where we move it is able to produce a kind of a, a total different landscape where individuals that in, in some way could be thought as just these red singular figures become differentiated by their interaction with all these different forms and landscapes. So, this kind of projects is something that we like to do in relationship with people who do not like or know or want to practice within the established ideas of, of just simply architecture as building, but architecture as, as, as installation. And so one of these projects has to do with an event that, that uh, for me was important to address. As a professor in one of the American universities, I would see every single uh, October my students disappear for a day or so uh, going to make their costumes for Halloween. And, and, and I was troubled because then I would see them and they would end up as like sexy nurses or vampires for that sake. And I really thought that I could use that creative energy to something more creative like that. So I said, okay, fine, why don't we do a critical Halloween? Meaning, Halloween is supposed to be scary. And there are a lot of scary things in art and architecture. So why don't we bring those two elements? People, they don't know how to be critical anymore, or they don't want to. Or if they are, they are in a very secretive manner, behind the walls, behind the back. So let's do it face on. Let's try to do a critical Halloween. So the there we did, and so the first year we said, what is the most scary thing? What is the thing that scares you the most? Snakes. Snakes, great. I don't know how to bring that into architecture, but maybe one day we can. But banality is pretty scary, isn't it? So the first year the theme was banality, and, and of course, with banality, uh, a lot of different people came with costumes that we had no idea what they were. And so these two guys, they were really scary in their kind of like whiteness and quietness. And, and so, of course, there are still parties and people come with all kind of different costumes that, uh, I mean, this was the uh, Archangels with a skin comb. I never understood clearly what that meant, but, um, but you had these like critical bubbles and like the idea of being critical for the sake of being critical. Uh, or Daniel Arsham, or this one actually was really funny, is the, the lasso tool of Photoshop, right? It's so banal, I mean, it really doesn't work, right? And so, um, and so what was interesting about this is that, that we were, in the second year, with the theme of metaphor, really interested not only as a party, but I don't know to how many parties do you go with a bibliography, but I'm very interested that actually you don't need only a bibliography for a seminar, but if you want to go to a party, you could also, also have a bibliography. So we did have a, a series of readings that you could read before going to the party to prepare your costume. And, and be very well versed towards the understanding of what it meant. And so the second year with metaphors, we had shades of white, or the Bilbao effect, or the open hand from the Corbusier, or the housing bubble. This is Carlos Mingue, the associate uh, curator of the storefront. And so these two guys that I mentioned you before, and, and this is where sometimes things come from me very interestingly close to architectural practice. Um, and it's, it's like, she looks like Hillary Clinton, and, but, but it's not about that, right? And so, Everyone has a name in the bottom of their costume, and so they were scales, you know, these little white figures that you put in your models as a way to make scale reference. And so if you go and buy them in the generic store, they always look the same. Like the woman is still this woman from like the 80s and like with the skirt and like the man is the hat. And, and so the idea that the subjects that we put in our architectures actually are already a preemptive imagination of the subjects, I think is something very interesting. Or these guys that came as two eyes. And, and inside, when you would read in here, it said banality is in the eye of the beholder. And, and, and of course, I think that's very much true. So last year was relevance and was about technology and what becomes relevant or irrelevant, notions of identity and these little ghosts. As you can see, that if you are in, in Google uh, Street View, you become irrelevant because your face is being erased. Yet, so of course, you're... Uh, uh, or like the, the art critic uh, Greenberg or line weights in, in architectural representation of, of course, Frank Gehry sending everyone to pure shit. Uh, uh, and so, 
Part of the projects they take sometimes very serious technological platforms. And this is a draw think tank before even collaborative drawing existed, and yet uh, we are happy to see that that already is part of it. So while Stoffer is a very small institution, and our offices were in the basement for more than like uh, 20, like almost 30 years, and once we moved the offices, thankfully two years ago, we were left with the space, and then we decided to do what a TV studio. So. Um, we have low battery. So what was great about uh, trying to do a TV studio was to suddenly try to reimagine a new format that would bring us into a new space of like global transmission of ideas. And so how do we communicate these days? How we actually are able to multitask? How Stoffen can produce uh, a platform for the transmission of ideas within this space of consumption is something that was extremely important to us. So we have been already like through two seasons of pilot programs and, and we're going to do the third one and we encourage any of you, regardless of where you are, to submit some of those. Um, the studio is in the basement and sometimes it looks like this or sometimes it looks like a, a drawing show by an, a drawing expert with his children and um, magnetic board, Michael Young, or sometimes it looks, looks like a night TV show of peace with Prem Krishnamurti with Parker Posey that if you are following, she's a kind of an actress. And so what is fascinating is that that basement is able to bring all kind of different characters uh, around conversations of art, architecture, and sometimes food. And of course, we have incredible apparitions uh, going through down the stairs. But from game shows to uh, translations to Eurovision contests or like basements in other places like, like the Mies Pavilion, the TV studio has proved to be an incredible a platform for experimentation of people that do not want to use, uh, 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 let's say, canonical forms of, of expression. So I encourage you to go into YouTube and to really check that out. So within this idea of projects, yes, we are interested in the mediation of the digital space, but we are also interested in the physical interaction and the value of being in a context in a particular site. So many people uh, have tried to uh, uh, convince a storefront to like, go and engage within their context, not only through a lecture, but through some real interaction in terms of content or production of ideas. And, um, and we have had many of those versions with Postopolis. Uh, and, and back in 2013, we started the Storefront International Series, the first one in the Dominican Republic, in which through a series of uh, uh, nine excursions through different parts of the island, we started to discuss particular ideas that we thought were important to address. So we collaborated with uh, Sashi Hoshikawa and the LAT, the Laboratorio de Arquitectura Dominicana, as a way to develop ideas and conversations around notions that progress were very much in the surface, yet in a site like this one, so if you look into this fantastic space, you will wonder what this is. So this is a place where um, uh, the illegal uh, 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 let's say workers for the sugar plantations are being picked up every morning uh, where they actually release their passports to go and work in these spaces where almost they, their human rights are being uh, removed from them and yet at the same time is a place where one can dance salsa or one can get a haircut or one can like wash their car or it is also a brothel so a place like that one where all these different problematic questions are being brought together to try to discuss what progress is something that for us was, was important. So through these different conversations, uh, sometimes in incredible sites like this where they're in the Mina Film Studios, what we like to do is to really bring individuals from the local government into context like this one. Here in this event we had representatives of the political uh, uh, and, and let's say educational and university context brought into a favela where there was no electricity, where this woman was sitting next to people that otherwise would never really engage. And it is part of that space of merging and being able to do events, not necessarily just in auditoriums or in like, cultural spaces, but in a market like this one in the border between Haiti and, 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 and the Dominican Republic, this is Dajabon, um, and try to understand what it goes what it means to get out of the cultural space, of the, of the framework of the institution, and to really do a, a work on site. So we participated uh, uh, as, as part of the Storefront uh, International Series in the Lisbon Triennale as a way also to get out. So we were asked to be in a place and we said, no, we're going to get out in the streets. And again, discussion of the questions that were pressing 
in this case, um, the idea of aging and how the city is really addressing the idea of getting old. <coughs> and moving through the city, almost as kind of like the leaves, as a kind of detours, trying to do new forms of, of discussion, sitting here under this incredible building of Alvaro Siza that was designed for the uh, World Expo. Um, what we were discussing was simply what was happening in front of us, that was uh, a, bus, a bus of tourists coming to see a building that in fact is empty. It is actually having no function. And so the idea is how the city itself is a participant in the making of conversations and how the city is sometimes more powerful than any other voice that one can bring is what we are extremely interested in this. And again, uh, cooking up paella this time in the middle of one of the squares, talking and asking the curators of the Triennale what was that, that that one produces when one makes culture by the clock, right? So, this is a project uh, that I'm very happy to talk about because we have been discussing uh, in the last 24 hours and we have had amazing uh, discoveries. Thank you to some of your team members. Um, the worldwide storefront uh, is born out of the desire to bring people, hopefully, probably like you, I guess, um, that already are practicing, that are already having ideas, that already are doing interventions within their own either neighborhood or galleries or apartments or kitchens or spaces, and try to understand how that culture uh, that doesn't want to belong necessarily to the establishment still needs a space and a platform for exposure, for actually being able to connect people and to be able to bring people that might not necessarily be uh, uh, just simply aligned to that. So how do we uh, produce a space, a platform for exposure? The worldwide storefront is, was born out of that desire. So we made a first attempt to try to bring um, individuals around the world that had a vision for what it means to produce alternative culture within their particular context and to create what we call more or less a kind of global biennial where around 10 sites around the world we selected individuals that made a proposal for alternative action uh, where they actually had funding uh, uh, for their own uh, particular projects where they had a digital strategy and so we provided just like a thousand dollars of seed funding advice in terms of like mentorship and, um, and allowing people to go and say if you go and ask someone for thousand dollars to do a project in your garage, they will say, ah, you know, we don't have now. You say, if you promise to give me thousand dollars, I may have a stronger application to be part of this global project. That's a different conversation, right? So how can we as an institution help people ask and get support within the local context is something that we are very interested in. So within this World Weather Stuff from First Edition, we uh, commission ultimately 10 different projects. And I encourage you to visit the website that um, uh, what it does is actually is taking us in all these different 10 locations and uh, is able to bring us to different uh, sound platforms and, uh, and, and uh, images and, and all these, each one of these 10 different sites understood very differently what it means to be alternative. It's not the same to be alternative in LA than to be alternative in Minnesota than to actually understand that in a kind of floating context. And yet what that allowed us is to also relax in this kind of moment of global cultural production of what is the image and the aesthetic uh, of what it means to produce uh, an impact. So we trusted those individual voices to understand what it really means to make a difference. If it is a radio program in a market or if it is a series of excursions to the tunnels of the city or if it is actually appropriating a particular office uh, or just simply putting in two chairs into, into the middle of the jungle is something that we didn't uh, uh, question, it's just simply something that we embraced. So if you actually go into the, into the website, you will be able to see some projects like this one, the Circus for Construction, that a bunch of uh, friends and colleagues at the university put together as a truck that was moving through the US, mostly through the Roosevelt area, through Detroit, and many of these uh, uh, cities that are actually facing a lot of different questions in terms of urbanization and, and development, and produce all kind of different events. This was in the Dominican Republic, or this one in LA, where this one was in, in, in Minneapolis, trying to really produce new forms of cultural engagement. And so what we want to do is to be able to provide a, a kind of a platform in a biannual basis for each one of those different projects. So uh, this was the way in which we brought all these projects in a kind of augmented reality into the gallery space, in which you could actually visit 
each one of the locations um, um, uh, digitally and also through this portal in which you could actually engage through a kind of a parallax effect, a, 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 a kind of literal view between the, the inside and the outside of a storefront, but the inside and the outside of this uh, global space through an intervention that we did with uh, Jana Vindren and Mark Fornes uh, that was, uh, I have to say, pretty uh, uh, mind-blowing for kids especially as this kind of like gigantic chewing gum. Um, but what was interesting about this is that made us think that we want to grow this platform. So we are going to be launching it probably in a year and a half from now as a platform that does five things. It provides first a social network for individuals that are interested in, in sharing their ideas, not only in a kind of art context or architectural context, but for artists, architects, whoever it is that wants to be part of this network. Second one is to provide an archive of projects that are actually happening, so an atlas. If you're going to Berlin or if you're going to Los Angeles and you want to know what is happening, something that's happening only tonight, that's going to be the platform that we hope is going to open you the, those doors that will produce an archive and at the same time provide for um, a space for like crowdsourcing from financial resources to intelligence to be able to find colleagues that uh, you might not know that may be able to help you in actually making those projects possible. And the fifth layer is to have a series of global ambassadors that are able to speak and report from a local point of view about what is actually happening. So through a series of global ambassadors around the globe, we do hope to have individuals that are concerned about having a sustained conversation about alternative forms of uh, cultural production. So these are different ways of uh, uh, visualization that we have been investigating with Timescape and, and we don't know if we're going to be using this in which one can move through space and time and we will see if we actually use that. But I encourage you to go into the website and, and look for the projects that were produced and keep tuned as we open up uh, uh, this platform. And so this was the introduction. Um, uh, and now I'm going to drink some water. Uh, but, um, wow, what time is it? Great. So, in two minutes, I'm going to explain you what was this lecture going to be about. <coughs> As an architect, um, most of the times, uh, spaces like a storefront uh, mostly have been extremely concerned with the idea of uh, maybe of the avant-garde, if you want, or what constitutes uh, the spaces of critical inquiry, who is the cool kid in the room. And yet, and we'd like to think about blogs and books and spaces that just enlighten those fantastic things that we say, wow, this is so great. Yet the truth is, is that we are to take responsibility about everything that is being built. We might have to start looking into architectures that we don't like that much into buildings, typologies, practices that we might not be that interested in. And yet, when we are taught at school, we are only taught how to look into great things, but we are not being trained in how to actually react into the ones that are problematic, into the ones that actually are not that great. So, I realized that we really do have to take ownership of that if we want to really care about what it means to be cultural producers, and so we cannot just now care about the five cool kids on the block, the three buildings in the city we like. We need to be able to look into everything. And how do we start that? And how do we start understanding the procedures and mechanisms that make that architecture? What are the financial structures? What are the production structures? So I am, into, I am actually very interested in the production of a new form of practice. If we are to produce a new collective in which one could bring the corporate firms that they have the expertise, the time, the facilities, the resources, um, together with the avant-garde, if you want, with the critical thinkers, with the ones who want to take radical action, and try to produce something that doesn't allow for those extremes, sometimes big failures in one side or big failures in the other side, to occur or happen. So Office US, that in fact is Office US, was the perfect excuse that allowed me to do that. Um, Storefront was always a great place for anyone who wanted to think things differently, but for the corporate spaces or for the architectural firms that thought of themselves already mature, was never necessarily a space of reference. So if I would knock their doors, they would not necessarily say hi, right? So how, how do you get someone to say hi? Well, you apply to be the representative of the US Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, you get it, and then you knock on their doors and then they will say, hi. And so, um, and so that's how you do it. 
And so how do we bring the entire architecture field together and how do we take the ownership of all those different buildings happening in any city around the world that actually might not be in the forefront of our architectural imagination is what this project is about. And, and we use US architecture and US architecture firms as a transversal lens of inquiry. We could have used something else. But that allows us first, of course, to fulfill the desires of the State Department, but at the same time to understand the politics that went in behind the country that actually built more than anyone in most places in an era of globalization that we are all embracing. So within this space, we identified more than 3,000 projects. And within those, we decided to actually take a selection of them and to start looking into what politics and what spaces of expertise went behind them. Within these, we found 200 architecture firms that instead of looking at them as individual elements, we wanted to look at them as this. Not as like 10, 200 logos, but as one single logo, where in fact, let's erase the identities, let's erase the egos, let's erase those business models, and let's think as we are all one entity. And so what happens when that is there? Happens that then you produce um, a Biennale that is having a kind of 100 years, 200 offices, 1,000 buildings, 25 issues, 6 months, 125 experts, 90 worldwide experts, and 6 office partners. We wanted to produce an alternative office in which these 6 partners um, that I'm going to maybe explain you later on, we selected, we made an open call for the partners of this office that we opened at the Venice Biennale with 90 outpost offices that were working together to create a corporate office. We wanted to create a contemporary corporate avant-garde office where radical thinkers were going to be running it from Venice together with 90 experts around the world having the visits of these experts that were partners and elemental figures within architecture firms but also within different spaces of practice. So more or less it looked like this. Each one of these, this one, each one of the firms that was in this, uh, in this repository. Smith uh, Group was uh, the first one, uh, founded in 1853, still working today. Here you can find Flanger Drive. This is actually, each one of these red dots was one of the projects that was um, uh, reported and exposed in the exhibition. And uh, each one of these red dots actually can tell you that this is SOM or this is actually KPF and so on. So, and here you have the most recent practices from uh, soil to Lyon Lyon. So this diagram that goes into a circle with like from the 4th of June to the 24th of November with each one of the 90 outpost offices that we had from Mexico City to Barcelona with these 25 issues that we selected from issues that we thought were important to address. Questions of what it means to do good, mission good, or questions of lead, or questions of export and import. And, and here with the names of the six partners, that in fact were eight people, that were running this office. So how does one think that an office is not only a contemporary framework, but is also a historical one? Meaning that you are not only yourself, you are yourself and everyone that precedes you. So the fact that when we are practicing, we are not just practicing alone, we are practicing with all contemporaries and actually practicing with all the past that is surrounding us. So that kind of diagram of, of who is the office is, is the one that actually took over the, the US pavilion at the Venice Biennale as the fixed first headquarters, and these were the partners. And so we selected them uh, online. This was our space of communication. We kept on talking for many days, and when I say we, it's like Anna Miliaki and Ashley Schaffer and Carlos Minguez and Michael Kubo uh, as, a, as a kind of like entire curatorial team that was really working in, in understanding what was that was going to happen in an office that tries to understand architectural practice in a very different way. So if you actually go to officeas.org, you will start seeing uh, all the kind of work that the partners develop over the six months at the Venice Biennale, and you will be able to find all those different projects and all the different issues um, and uh, through a website that actually uses this idea of appropriation uh, of different platforms. Um, and, and from Google Maps to uh, Instagram to all kind of different uh, elements like office manuals from, uh, from the world of, of architectural practice. So I encourage you to really look into this mostly because what you will find is this entire repository of projects that uh, you can actually get them in these physical books that I actually just wrote a copy for you guys. 
um, it's it's a space of entire exposure to these 25 issues. Uh, so how does one go and digest an entire space of historical expansion? And so we selected these 25 issues as a way to enter each one of the weeks uh, and try to digest how do we talk about architecture today and how do we become critical uh, in a time in which ideas are a bit dissolved through notions of sustainability, through questions of politics and agency, but how do we make the step historically towards a future, right? And so to be able to take that intelligence um, was something that uh, this archive of thousand projects really allowed us uh, in order to move forward. So these thousand projects that were represented, each one of them as a binder, and I don't know if any of you went to Venice, but this is more or less how it looked. So again, probably if you would enter the pavilion, you would be totally bored and frustrated because it was really not meant for the audience. We could care less about Venice. Venice was just the excuse for the project to really actually happen. And so the, the idea is that many of the graphics and statistics that we tried to produce was to try to understand the relationship between architecture and economy. So this is how the dollar uh, was throughout history over the last hundred years, and to see how the different currencies uh, uh, change in relationship to like economic variations, and see the amount of projects that were built by American firms in those uh, particular countries, and try to see if there was any relationship between economy and architecture. Guess what? There is none. So, uh, and of course, the idea is that we kept on producing a series of research and data visualization in order to try to understand things that we might not know. Questions of like visibility in terms of women and practice, or questions of like the museums and where those museums, uh, after the Bilbao effect, were produced, or the idea of the, the export of uh, architectural practices, or the idea of immigration and where people were coming from when they were escaping from particular wars or spaces of oppression within their countries. So this series of, of booklets and works were uh, somehow documenting sometimes things that were not that clear. The Hilton hotels, most of the times used as a device for soft power, according to like Conrad Hilton, as a way to produce American ideology abroad. Uh, Hilton hotels were built in Istanbul, they were built in places where they were considered that was the frontier of the US empire, and yet Hilton hotels like this one in Amsterdam were used for uh, conditions uh, like this one that we all know, or like this one where like, Fidel Castro, when he took over in, in Havana in 1959, the first place that he took over was the, Hill, the Havana Hilton because it was the only place that had air conditioning, right? So you can use air conditioning to make love, to make revolutions, or to do capitalism. So the question here is, what are the politics of a space and how does one discuss them? So I encourage you to, if you're interested in any of those subjects, to get any of the books. We have from these four books, uh, the first two are already published, and so they are here. And this one, uh, it's under construction as this one is. This is everything that was produced over the six months in Venice. And this is, a, a, as I mentioned before, is this office manual that compiles all the different manuals of architectural offices with fictional uh, propositions. So I'm not going to go through it, but I'm sure that you can read fast enough to get a sense of it. And, and the same with the others. Uh, each one of those books really tries to have a comprehensive understanding of spaces where one can start to understand the relationship between the US and Russia, between forms of architectural practice and the mechanisms and methods of how does one go into an architecture of like corporate production from like three people in an office to having like 600 people and how does one learn from like Taylorist modes of production and what are the implications of that, not only for the human edifices but also for the architectural edifices behind that. And what was interesting about this project is that you could have in the same space people like Peter Eisenman or SOM or uh, people like Andrew Zago and, and, and firms like KPF and, and be able to really start measuring where does one draw the line of what constitutes uh, this space of architectural production. So we did it in Venice for six months and we want to do it again. We want to keep on having Office as a laboratory, not of US, but of different architectural collectives and collective aspirations. Uh, we may bring it to New York, um, we may bring it to Kiev, we don't know. But we are very interested in the production of new architectural laboratories where we might be able to bring new forms of collectivity and action beyond uh, the idea of, of the self, beyond the idea of, of the corporate, beyond the idea uh, of 
of Om Afro. So, these are some of the images of what happened in Venice. I'm not going to go through that. Uh, it's always great to have the people from the State Department come uh, and tell you uh, how uh, patriotic you are being, when in fact uh, you are just really trying to make an argument towards architectural practice. Um, you should look in some of the work that the, the partners they did. Uh, I think it's incredibly fascinating the, the, the way in which they understood their participation for the Helsinki Guggenheim competition. We did uh, a panel in Venice in which uh, uh, this idea of trying to understand the politics uh, that that project produces is very interesting. Um, many of the, of the forms uh, and projects, they took the form of dinners or like particular forms of expression that go beyond again the idea of how to make uh, a building, but actually how to produce an edifice in these questions, notions of lead, but not in terms of ecological sustainability, but of labor sustainability. And so moving through all these different dinners, that, uh, uh, that they produced, conversations followed, and workshops with different universities from Cornell University to uh, Ohio State uh, came by. So the design by Leon Leon, I have to say that this project was an incredible project that was made with more than 300 people. And um, trying to understand how does one make an office also a spa space of display and of experimentation is something that took an incredible effort and, and that uh, it produced an incredible uh, space for uh, relaxation and fascination. This was an incredible bet, I don't know if any of you managed to sit on it. But the project went not only through the spatial design, but also through the design of the uniform, uh, together with the slow and steady wins the race. Uh, actually, obviously, trying to think about the kind of entertainment that they would have, but even the smell, we designed the smell for each one of the rooms trying to do an archaeology of how an architectural office is smelled in the 1900s or in the 1940s or in the 1960s from the different glues and materials that occupied each one of the spaces. So with Christophe Laudumier we designed that space. And so what we wanted to actually do with uh, each one of those projects, this was a project by Brett Bayer of photography, and this is a film by Amy Siegel that I hope that at some point you might be able to see. We produce a series of documents that try to bring um, that understanding. This was a film that goes transversely through 10 architectural firms in New York as a continuous shot, as a way to report the sameness and the differences of all these architectural firms. And so this was somehow the inaugural image, and with this one I'm going to end, to say that this was an incredible collective effort to try to bring uh, into the surface a uh, kind of history that no one really wants to look at. So I think it is important for us to, to come together in more forms uh, than we are able to imagine. The worldwide Astrophon is one, Office Us is one, and with that I just want to thank you for your time and patience. But I, I do think that uh, it's not that 
I don't think that we need dates of expiration. I think we need structures of growth and change. And as I say, like, I think failure is an extremely successful device towards the production of more resilient forms of practice. So I, I mean, failing today is the success of tomorrow, right? And, and I, I always say success never arrives late. Therefore, one should never wait for it, right? So, and, and I'm very interested in hearing, uh, when I was uh, visiting you guys last summer, uh, I was really interested in what kind of workshops you were doing, and very interested in the forms of engagement you are having here as well, right? And how does one produce new, new spaces of collaboration? But yes, I'm very interested in all of us breaking away from our names, labels, uh, brands, websites, and to say, okay, what can we do together? Right? We close the doors here. What is the human capital that each one of us has? And what is that that we can really contribute? Because the truth is, is that sometimes I think we are missing the potential that each one of us carries by trying to delimit those boundaries too much. I don't know if I answered your question better. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A lot of things have occurred actually in places that I have gone and initiatives have started and I think that's the beauty for part of it because each one of us I think carries different ways of being and until you are not provoked with something sometimes you don't realize that, that you already carried something else that so you just need to be shaken a bit, right? And it's not just about doing the same, it's just about realizing that you could do things differently and I think students are in that formative stage in which is very important for them to see sometimes things from a different angle. Which has thank you. Um, I have one question. Have you ever met a constructive voice in any other uh, country where you're still being brought? What's that thing? Uh, <coughs> well, <laughs> no, not yet. You have uh, uh, now I'm, like, I'm, I'm going to, like, I'm scanning, right? I'm going through all the different lectures. It's because as much as we understand um, the political context as something that uh, I think here is more omnipresent probably than anywhere else as well from like, the current conditions, we are in a country that is in conflict, right? And, and yet, um, and the politics are very present even within the understanding of architecture and art practices. I mean, we were just today around the city and they were saying, you know, here we are going to be removing like some of the common <coughs> symbols and so on, and the idea of the communization. I mean, there are so many latent things. And, and yet, um, 
one of the things that for me is very important is to understand how do we go even beyond sometimes those immediate questions that sometimes are just reactive, reactive or reactionary, right? If we try to go beyond that space of immediate action, I mean, today I saw maybe two or three museums of, uh, uh, of, 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 of technology, or no, they didn't call them of technology, but it was about military uh, tools, right? And like tanks and, and, and wow. I mean, if you go to Barcelona, there is not one, right? I mean, museums are not about that. So, but here you have so many museums that are about the military forces and how you defend yourself and how do you attack and during the communist times and during the present times. I, if, if I keep on seeing more museums of that, I will start thinking that the next museum should be another museum of military forces, right? When in fact maybe the next museum should be a museum of paellas, to say something totally absurd, right? But so I think that's the kind of. Um, I think that's the important question of like how do we shift the conversation to maybe not avoid the subject, but to cut it transversely in a way in which it's not that we are disrespectful to a history or to a context, but we are able to look at it in a different angle in which suddenly things are rendered anew, right? Because otherwise we <coughs> get uh, in a kind of a loophole. So, um, and while I was talking, I was going through all this, no, I have not engaged with, the, with that kind of context. But I mean, I, I, I've been in, in, in different spaces and I think all of us have to deal with ideological lineages. In Spain we have to deal with like Franco times and then you have to deal with tourist times. I mean, we are all under the oppression of particular regimes, either neoliberal or capitalist <coughs> or questions of progress, right? So um, I think progress is as problematic and shopping malls are as problematic as uh, the museums of military uh, intelligence. So the question here is to really identify that uh, we probably have too many McDonald's and too many things, right? So what are all those different things that we need to change within each particular context? So I don't, I don't look into countries according to like the established divisions between communist and, and capitalist. And I like to go beyond those levels to try to find other spaces of action and to operate as a Trojan horse within each any system, within any political uh, structure, and to be able to really move the things from the inside out. Well, it's about the footprint of uh, the stock from Spain, the Toriano. Um, Can you speak up? Yes, it's about the footprint that we have said. Yes. The court, uh, so, uh, when you just kind of said that uh, when, you make, um, when you make a plan, an architectural plan, and you make a kind of angle uh, that has this um, very narrow corner uh, and it is said that it provides a deep fear for spirit and for human being and existence and you cannot experience that um, so it's like really a style and really like a zone. Uh, so you cannot experience uh, the actual uh, what it produces what it produces uh, when you visit If I understand your question properly, um, I, I do think that it's not natural. It's, it's a very hostile now because we need to be a way of living. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I'm, I'm hearing you. I actually, yeah, that space was uh, is the residue of, uh, of our, actually an incision, a urban incision that was made in that block at the beginning of the, at the end of the uh, uh, 19th century in New York City, so that was an existing building, right? It's not that we made it this way, it was like that. And um, what I really do love about that space is that when you are in the wide angle, you are into an interior space and you are slowly being brought outside. You are kicked out of the space, even if you don't realize it. Um, to go and say, there have been a lot of different theories in terms of like from gestalt to questions of like uh, I don't know if you're like interested in Japanese yeah. notions of, of like um, 
how does one produce the proper energetic equilibrium. Um, if you would ask me, like what I would do in this, in this room, I would, if they would have said, how do you would you like to do the face, I would have everyone to sit diagonally, right? Instead of like this, I would have asked everyone to sit diagonally. And you probably would have said, oh, oh no, no, this is really not good. This is really producing strange tensions towards you, right? And I would say, this is going But so the, the question is that I think architecture is able, by its proximity to the body, has a power of, uh, of transformation. And I think that there are no right and wrong spaces. I think each space has a potential that one might recognize and use and, and utilize. So um, to say that a museum needs to be rectangular or circular. No, no, no. A museum is a space This one you experience it in the sidewalk. I always like to say that the, 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 the interior wall of the gallery is in the other side of the street. When you're even in the other side of the street, you're still inside the gallery, right? So I think it's embracing the impossibility of the gallery as a way to create a gallery that goes beyond the gallery. I mean, at least that's, that's why I love the space. I and mean, if you would give me an interior space, I would probably be extremely bored at some point uh, of what that is capable of producing. But maybe that's something that... Uh, did I answer your question? Yes. You said that it will fit with the uh, art. If you are inside one of the ground somewhere, it will be automatic that is used in the... Outside. Outside. That is also inside. I always like to say that I'm working very hard to lose my job so that if I do my work really, really well, innovation and experimentation will happen anywhere else so that the storefront can close. And yet, it's true. I mean, we, we need to utilize the, the capital, the cultural capital that the institution has built over these 30 years to uh, keep on producing some kind of sustainability. In terms of even just in financial terms, I mean, Stockholm is a non-for-profit, we don't have uh, any kind of public funding, nor like individual funding, like if you're not members, I ask everyone to become a member, right? And so it's, that is something that is very difficult to raise funds if I would be constantly changing of identity or site and so on. So um, we try to utilize and absorb many of those conditions well, maybe we are doing some projects that I don't lecture about, that I don't tell you about, that are still happening, right? So those ones, uh, I can probably not talk about. So everything I'm saying is the ones that are happening, have a logo and are recognizable. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, guys.